With that being said, we'll uh, bring this June 8th City Council meeting to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilman Jindal. Present. Councilman Lennart. Here. Councilman Rigsby is absent. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly. Here. And Mayor Duper. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. And I think, believe we have a report from the City Attorney. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The City Council has been in closed session on the item listed on the agenda, which was a conference with Labor Negotiator. Uh, the Council received a report, gave direction. There's no action to report at this time. Thank you, sir. We will start out with the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. However, uh, Dr. Rigsby is not here yet, so uh, I will do the uh, pledge if somebody else wants to do the invocation. Okay, we're on. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Mr. City Manager, do we have any items to be added or deleted? No, sir. This will be the uh, opportunity for anybody in the public wishing to speak on a non-agendized item. Uh, I do have some comments here uh, that were, uh, one is for an agendized item that we can talk about later and I will I'll, uh, talk about those comments and then another thing we'll bring up in, uh, in new business, uh, Dick, about that thing that happened to you. So we'll bring that up in a little bit. So anyone in the public wishing to speak? I'll look over at the IT world. I don't see any hands over there. And uh, we'll go ahead and move along. Dr. Rigsby is here. Good evening. The invocation. Okay. Moving right into scheduled items. Item number one. A presentation from the fire department, it looks like. Good evening, council. City staff, citizens, my name is Tom Ingalls, Fire Marshal, City of Loma Linda. I'm going to do a brief uh, presentation about uh, some training some of our department members recently went through uh, through Safe Kids Worldwide. They became uh, certified car seat technicians. It's something that was on my uh, to-do list. When I was still on the floor, we had a lot of citizens that would come to the fire station, ask personnel, hey, can you help us install a car seat or check to make sure they installed it correctly? A lot of us are parents, so we tried our best instead of turning them away. But this course um, was four days. Um, we had six members from Loma Linda Fire Department that volunteered. They, they weren't voluntold to show up, so that was awesome. We had three members from the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, two uh, deputies in the Traffic Enforcement Unit, and then um, one sheriff specialist, community specialist. And then we had someone who recertified from another agency locally. So it was a great uh, uh, something between Loma Linda Fire Department, Sheriff's Department, Safe Kids Worldwide, as well as Loma Linda University. Michelle Parker at the university is the one, she's the regional coordinator for Safe Kids. Um, so it was a great partnership with the university to kind of work through this. So I'll, I'm gonna go through these slides very quickly. This is just some of the content uh, we learned over the last uh, four days in the, in the course. One of the big ones is just some of the new laws that came into effect for young children. And then one of the ones that's actually kind of hit close to home for one of our members was Caitlin's Law. This was put in effect in 2001 when a, a child unfortunately was left in an unattended vehicle for two hours. Um, and actually one of our members, the girl, uh, actually lived just down the street from in Corona. So kind of hit close to home. You can go to the next slide, please. We learned about collision dynamics. Uh, 
just real quick brief, you got the vehicular collision, then you have the human collision within the vehicle, and then the internal collision. So that's why it's imperative that these car seats are installed correctly to really help with the internal and the human collision component within the vehicle during a motor vehicle accident. Next slide, please. So really, uh, just more kind of just general knowledge about why it's so important to install the car seats correctly. Um, I'll even admit, after doing the course, I have a four-year-old daughter, four going on 13, went back to the vehicle, and I even installed the car seat incorrectly, uh, thinking I knew what I was doing. I can get into that a little bit later on how that was and how, how I rectified it. You can move on. These are the different age groups that we learned about, as well as the different car seat types. We probably touched over 50 different car seats over the four days, learned how to install the different type of car seats. Um, and we really just scratched the surface. There's tons of manufacturers and models out there. And honestly, it was really, uh, really, really impressive the difference in the different car seat manufacturers and how they install in different vehicles. We worked in different vehicles. So it was a lot of hands-on learning. Next slide, please. These are just some of the statistics uh, and also some of the just general knowledge we learned about forward facing versus rear facing. One of the big things on this slide is the vehicle restraint system. This is something I learned in the course. It's all set up for automatic locking. So when we get in an accident as an adult, it locks up free right away during a car seat or excuse me, during a motor vehicle accident. When we install these car seats, we actually learned that a lot of, well, pretty much all cars nowadays, they can, you can um, change the function of the seatbelt. And how you do that is you pull the seatbelt all the way out, you hear like a lock, and then you ratchet it in. So when you use the seatbelt, instead of the anchor, lower anchor straps, you want to use that function because now you don't have any play in the seatbelt. And that's one of the things I was doing wrong in our, our vehicle was I had it set up for an adult. So there would have been that play during an auto accident. Now I have it ratcheted down to where if we, in the event we do get in a motor vehicle accident, it's locked into place and there's no play uh, in, the, in the child seat. So that's something I learned um, that was important. Next slide, please. Something else I never knew that car seats actually expire. So um, yeah, I, I, I checked ours out at home. It was still in good shape. But uh, another big thing that we learned is really uh, having, we fill out the registration cards for the parents now when they bring in a new car seat so they can get re, uh, recall information automatically. That's something a lot of people don't do with any uh, product in the home is they buy it, they throw those uh, registration stuff away and they, you know, hopefully it works. But with car seats, it's really important. That's why we fill it out and send it in for them now. Uh, so the parents will get those uh, recall updates. Next slide, please. Uh, something else we learned about in the course, uh, down in the lower corner, you can see the uh, seatbelt airbag. Um, so it's really important not only to look at the car seat installation manual, but also the vehicle uh, maintenance guide, the vehicle guide, because uh, a lot of the newer vehicles are being built with these actual inflatable seatbelt airbags that can really obviously affect if there's a kid in there in the car seat. So uh, it's really uh, important to not only Look at the car seat manual, but also the vehicle manual. Make sure they, they kind of are in tune and it, it's able to put a car seat there. Next slide, please. This is just some more very general knowledge and nomenclature about rear facing stuff that we learned in here. Um, believe it or not, they showed a lot of collision vehicle uh, videos in our course. And I know it's kind of weird, but the sh rear facing is the key, right? And they actually show a lot of videos where the rear facing car seat is actually designed so it's actually supposed to take the impact during a collision so that shell actually flips up, right? You want it to kind of absorb the impact and not be locked in place. Some parents, they showed us some stuff where parents were purposely tying down the rear facing car seat improperly. So, it, you know, they, they think, hey, it's not supposed to move at all, but those things are actually designed so when it takes the force of the impact from the seat in front of it, it kind of helps absorb the blow. And, and then they showed ones where parents improperly installed them and locked them down and, and yeah, it wasn't a good outcome for the kids. So it's really interesting how these things are designed. Next slide. Convertibles, this is the type of car seat that I have for our child. This is like the one where it goes from rear facing, forward facing, and then you typically can take the back off and it turns into a booster. It kind of grows with the child. The thing I did wrong is there's uh, uh, a term called latch, and it stands for the lower anchor tether 
So you have the, I always thought the lower anchor straps that usually come with the car seats and a lot of the newer vehicle uh, uh, have like the anchor strap areas in your car. I thought that was the best, you know, option, but those are only good for up to a certain weight. So our child actually exceeded the weight for that after digging more deeply into the class and into our car seat uh, booklet. So then we reversed it to the car seat belt. Um, so after all these years, I guess our daughter was improperly installed as well. So it helped at home. Next, next slide. And again, this is just more basic uh, information about what the combination can do versus a, uh, a booster seat. Um, they really pushed uh, in, in the class to keep the kid in this type of combination seat as long as they can. Even if your child is ready to just have a booster seat, um, the combination seats are really great because it also helps with the, the harness. So you got the five point harness versus just a seat belt. And then also you have the head protection for the child. Next slide, please. And then they also taught us in the class about the five, te uh, five step test. A lot of parents are very eager to move their child from a car seat into the, into the big kid seat, you know, just a regular uh, car seat. So we really uh, talk with the parents about the five steps to make sure they're old enough the weight requirement, they're big enough to do it, and if they can sit still, a lot of kids are still squirmy, and I know when I was a kid, I used to put the, you know, the um, chest belt part of it around my, you know, uh, the back and that kind of stuff, because it used to rub my neck, so you gotta really make sure not only the kid, you know, meets the size criteria and the weight criteria, but also they can sit still for long periods of time. And the common misuses, we kind of learned about that. Uh, a lot of parents, uh, we did it as well, where you put in some of these aftermarket devices like mirrors, um, that kind of stuff. Again, we saw a lot of videos in this course where those things become flying projectiles in auto vehicle accident and uh, motor vehicle accident, sorry, and, and, and injures the child. So they're really big on just keeping the car seat as it is, not using aftermarket devices like the, uh, a lot of places sell extra padding for the harnesses, but that actually uh, prevents it from getting a good snug fit. And there's also been uh, instances where children have, you know, suffocated from having too much bulky items around them. So, and the expiration date's a big one too. I, again, something I learned. I didn't know car seats have an expiration date, but you sure do. And of course, last but not least, every parent's always going to ask, "What is the best child safety seat?" And these are the three things that we always kind of walk through the parents what's the best for you, the child, and the vehicle, and what's gonna stay with them and make them safe. So that's what we did for over four days. Um, the requirement now for our department members with the Sheriff's Department ourselves is we have to do two car seat events uh, every two years, and then we have to do continuing education, keep our certifications up. So I think it's a big benefit for the community, uh, for PR events, and us also when people come to the fire station and ask for us to check their car seats. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Well, it's uh, very timely, um, given my predicament. Oh, okay. Well, let so, us know. You know, bring your vehicle over. We'll, we'll, we'll check yeah, it out. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. Okay. If you don't know, well, my wife just found out she's pregnant. Wow. Well, about four months ago. So, yeah, a little bit of an age gap between the 13-year-old and the new one, but cool. Yeah, we're, we're happy to help. Bring, come by the fire station, make sure that thing's installed properly. <laughs> Sounds like I'll be there. This this is good. Yeah. Do you have uh, copies of that literature by any chance or no? Yeah, I can absolutely forward you this uh, PowerPoint. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, we're going to move into a public hearing. Council Bill R-2021-20, uh, approving our annual report for the uh, Landscape Maintenance District. Have Jeff Peterson to present this item. Jeff? I don't know how you follow up with that. I'm a boomer. I stayed in the back shelf of the car, <laughs> sometimes in the floorboards. Yeah. Still here. Don't know how that happened. It kind of <laughs> does. Uh, again, 20th time, Landscape Maintenance District. Uh, this is the uh, opening for this. You've already seen the uh, draft budget. It hasn't changed much. Uh, we're still looking at it a balance to levy. The city is going to contribute nearly $100,000 as general benefit as well as some 
of the annexations that we are responsible for. You'll notice that it's almost $200,000 for maintenance, uh, 180 for the utilities, that's water and electricity. And then we have capital uh, improvements. Uh, nearly half of the 76 uh, annexations are either self-maintained or not, or there's no maintenance required, excuse me, required. And that is uh, because the level of service that is enjoyed by our contractor, uh, the lowest uh, bid, is not to the satisfaction of the homeowner association, and they choose to have a little bit uh, nicer uh, landscaping than we are providing, and so we they have the option to they opt out and uh, maintain it themselves. We still keep the landscape maintenance district itself uh, in the background. If there is ever a, a problem with the HOA, we can come back and, and assess and take over again. Any questions? Yes, sir. My question is, um, given that we have differential rates for landscape maintenance and equal quality throughout our, insti throughout our entire city for landscape maintenance, right? Correct. Um, is there a requirement for a vote of the people to reduce the fees of those who are overpaying relative to those who are not paying much? In, in the report, you'll notice that the first 50 annexations did not have a COLA uh, a CPI adjustment. And so they were set at the rate that they were set many years ago, and we have not had the opportunity, nor will we have the opportunity to change those rates without going to a vote of the people. And that could be a vote of that particular group, or it could be a vote of everyone. And what we found is on the landscape maintenance district itself, when it was originally set up, there was one set of rules, there's a new set of rules now. I have, we've taken straw polls, and we can take one today, and I haven't found any group of individuals who wish to raise their taxes upon themselves. So the ability to pass a referendum or a, a vote of the people to self-tax uh, is a, a big require a, a huge effort in education and to, to convince the folks that they need to pay more for what they may already be enjoying. Um, then we found that there's a potential that more than just those people in that group are enjoying the benefits of the landscape. That those that are passing by may also be enjoying the benefits of, the bat, of that. And so then we have to ask ourselves, do we put this vote out to everyone who would enjoy it and therefore need to pay? Or do we leave it as it is, save the cost of the studies and the cost of the education, the outreach, et cetera, uh, and already we have a general benefit of about $100,000 that the city contributes. So are we going to gain anything with the potential passage of a self-tax, or are we already paying that and we might as well just leave things as they are without rocking the boat. Follow-up question. My next question is, what if we decided to just unilaterally, as the council, eliminate all landscape maintenance districts and put the whole thing on the general fund? Would that require a vote of the people to untax themselves? Or could we just do it unilaterally without a vote? And if we did it, how much would it cost? Well, the current cost is about a half million dollars a year. And the, for the whole city. For the whole, for the annexation districts. Yes. The, the whole city is not burdened with an annexation district. There are some parts of the city, the older parts of the city, that don't have any. So that currently they do not pay any special assessments. So if you choose to do it this other way, you'd have to incorporate that, that into your general budget. And if there's three out of five or better, then I believe you can spend your, this, the tax dollars as you see fit. See, I'm, I'm concerned about the 14th Amendment, equal protection equal under protection. the law. 
and um, I just think it's kind of odd that we have some people from other districts that are essentially getting not a free ride, but maybe a three-quarters ride, and everyone else is paying full fare, and that's not equal protection under the law. I just wonder if we could find out how much it would cost if we just eliminated the, this, this unfair distribution of burden by taking it on the general fund. I just wonder how much it would be. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it half the general fund or is it 1% or what, you know, what, how could we? Page 17 yeah. indicates that it's $517,000. But is that just for the ones that underpay and have to be subsidized? No. Or is that for everything? That's city, everything. Citywide. citywide. City, that's, every, okay. that's everything for the current 76 annexation districts. Okay. And we're underfunded by about 100000 there is a hundred thousand dollar general fund burden. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, Out of that five hundred, four hundred is raised by the annexation district. Correct. And one hundred comes from the general fund. Correct. So it would be an extra four hundred thousand to relieve everyone of the burden. Yes. Okay. Just wondering. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions from the dais? Okay, we're going to open, open the public comment. Any members of the public wishing to speak on this item, please step forward. Throw up your hand on Zoom. Seeing no takers, we will close the public comment section and I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move approval of Council Bill R-2021-20. I'm waiting for a second, but no, oh, well, right on. I thought maybe I thought uh, I thought I thought this might just die on its own, and we'll have to come up with the general fund money. Okay, we have a first and a second, Madam Clerk. And the motion is to adopt Council Bill number R-2021-20, approving the annual report and assessments for Landscape Maintenance District number one for fiscal year 2021-2022. Councilman Chandal? Aye. Councilman Lennard? Aye. Councilman Rigsby? Aye. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to the Streetlight Benefit Assessment District. Hey, Mr. Peterson, welcome back. <laughs> that last report was just simulated. I don't know if I can follow it. And I have the same question for this one. <laughs> this one is a little different, though. Uh, this one does balance. Uh, the cost is $361,000, uh, almost $300. It covers the entire city. It's for street lights. Uh, the cost is slowly going down as we change out from high pressure sodium to LED lights. Uh, more than half of our lights currently are owned by SCE and we own the other half. Uh, so it's that, that half that we are able to have more control of and that, that's what we, this one is covering. And we are doing our best to enjoy the benefits of LED lighting. Uh, one of the benefits is they, it costs less and we don't have to maintain them as often because they last longer. One of the lesser benefits is we have to space them a little closer together. They don't reach out. They don't have the bleed over that the high pressure does. It's a very definite light. It goes for a certain space and that's it. So as soon as you get out of that, you're out of you're in the shadow. So we are currently spacing them uh, about 60 feet closer than we do the high pressure sodiums. And the cost though has come down tremendously since I started this program. They were in the five six hundred dollar range and now they're they're in the two hundred dollar range. If there's questions, I'm available. And I may be back. So if we wanted to increase the number of street lights, say I wanted to increase the street lights in district number one, who would pay for that? We would have to study to see if it was uh, warranted and it would uh, come on to the report for the following year that there was maintenance or capital improvement uh, increases and then that particular group would pay. 
So we would not unilaterally go out and decide that they need it. They would have to request it. Got it. So say it's in assessment district one, would only that assessment district's uh, prices go up? Yes. Thank you. What's the, real quick, uh, what's the threshold and the amount of people that would request it? Well, Just it has to be 50% plus one. Okay. Question. Uh, we have been working to transition for, I don't remember, several years now to the LED lights from the, uh, the pink lights that we've had yes. for years. And we're nearly we're, there. Yeah, so where are we at in that process? I believe we're 80, 90 percent. We're nearly there. Okay, good. Yeah, we pursued it to the so point where... So approving this budget will facilitate that transition or complete yes. it? Continue doing it. Can, can I ask a question relative to Continue that? Continue doing it, the okay. replacement light bulb. You, you may notice that the assessment for every purchase, every parcel is similar, $56.14. For the, oh, there's a few that are a little bit less. Okay, never mind. Thank but you. most of them are 56, 14. You said about half of our, you know, I've got experience with this before, about half of our lights are Edison owned and Correct. half are city owned. Yes. And when we talk about the change over to LED, is we're 80, 90% compliant with the city? Us. Us. Yes. Okay. The ones we have control of. And then what, what are the, what are the options in working with Edison for that? We, we are. We will continue to work with them. Well. And additionally, the LED lights are more efficient. Right. So it's in their own best interest to change them out. And they have been. Slowly, but they have been. And if you go around the city, you'll notice the lights that are on the wood poles. Those are usually Edison lights. And they used to all be high pressure sodium. And in the last three, four years, they have been changing them out themselves, simply because the price has come down and they're a lot more efficient. I'm just curious. It, it, at a certain point when we start getting a disparity with different colored looking lights, can that, can that argument to be uniform be made you can. to get Edison to, just curious. And we usually use about a 4,000 Kelvin. Hey, Kelvin, uh, the brightness of the light uh, comes from very fairly dim at, and the lower range uh, at 1,200 all, all the way up to 6,000, 8,000, which is, it's hard on your eyes light. It's, too white. Operating room, right? Too white. too white, blue white. Yeah, it's too it's too much. So we we have one that's a little bit softer, and it's around thirty five hundred to four thousand. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, we'll open the public comments. Anyone wishing to come forward, either in person or on Zoom? Again, no takers. We'll close the public comment and I will entertain a motion to move this item. Move it. We have a first, second, first and a second. Madam Clerk. And the motion is to adopt Council Bill number R-2021-21, approving the annual report and assessments for Streetlight Benefit Assessment District for fiscal year 2021-2022. Councilman Jindal. Second. Or Councilman. Lynn. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Councilman Lenart. Yes. Councilman Rigsby. Yes. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly. Aye. And Mayor Duper. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And we will uh, move along to the consent calendar. Move it. Does that a motion and a second? Madam Clerk, whenever you catch up. Not a problem. Uh, the motion is to approve the items on the City Council consent calendar. Councilman Jindal? Aye. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly? Aye. And Mayor Duper? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now we're going to move on to old business, item number 15, consideration of an application for designation of us being a tree city or tree city USA. Councilman Jindal. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Continuing on from our last meeting, uh, this is for consideration of the City Council to um, have Loma Linda enter to become a Tree City USA. Uh, I believe I went over the benefits of trees last time around, and uh, we do have some benefits right in front of you in the agenda item. 
I personally prefer the study done by uh, the University of Loma Linda in conjunction with the city. Um, so read those at your leisure. Uh, just a few highlights that you do see in front of you is that we have a reduction in cost of energy, um, better stormwater management, erosion control, uh, and it boosts property values in our community. So a lot of benefits of having trees, and I don't think uh, many people would deny that you know, more trees are good. Uh, some of the standards that we have in order to become a Tree City USA, we already fulfill. Uh, standard number one, that we must have a tree board or department. Uh, we already have one. We have a tree care ordinance, which is standard number two. Is it a board or a department that it's we have? Park, park and beautification committees. So. Okay, so that's our tree board. Yep. Does it... We have an existing committee made up of citizens yes. that already is responsible for maintenance of trees. Yes, and, and when I ask them to talk about trees and beautification, which is mean plant more trees, they, they have an input on, in that. And another question. Do they have independent authority to fine or under this Tree City USA designation, do they have some ability, independent authority to harass people who do not meet their standards? No, no does yeah, authority have to come back to the council, I mean, to, to do the finding? It's the existing yeah. parks and beautification yeah. committee, so I don't think so. So they can't go out and give fines? So, so there are codes that uh, that have to be met in terms of what trees are installed and where. No, sir. The, the code have to do with the tree trimming, and that that came from the California JPIA Joint Power Insurance Authority. That we have to make sure that we keep our trees pruned and, and maintained. Hmm. To okay. avoid fires. Yeah, no, it, it makes nice. sense and keep them away from the electrical wires and telephone wires. Yes, and, and that, that also inspect by, by Edison and also a fire marshal. He already left. The fire marshal too, so. Okay. The, the next follow-up question is, does this Tree City USA designation require some more authoritarian approach or is that adequate? Authoritarian in what respect? telling people what they have to do beyond what we currently do? No. Okay. Now, it, it's a fair question because uh, the street that I live on, everybody's got different trees. Mm -hmm. And some people, uh, you know, on a fairly regular schedule have them thinned out and topped, and some don't. I think they've lived there for 30 years and they haven't had their trees trimmed. So I, it's a fair question. Yeah, and just to make sure we're all on the same page here, this is not a government agency, right? This is... No, I understand that. Well, that's, yeah. that's why I was asking, does this designation require some kind of an upgrade in the authoritarian approach that a government takes? And if not, then it's yeah. not threatening at all. Yeah, <clears throat> since it's not a government agency, they can't make no, the I, city I, I, do anything that we don't want to do. But they no. can make you do it to get the designation. That's what I'm asking, yeah. If they propose something that we wouldn't want to do, we wouldn't receive the designation, yeah. Yeah. So um, you were going through the standards, and, and is it all four, or is it one of the four? All four. It's all four. Okay, We must meet all four, yep. Okay. So standard three, again, the first two standards we've met, standard three, we already have $2 per capita allocated. City population is between 24, 25,000, um, and our budget right now uh, for uh, tree maintenance and just tree uh, planting trees is already above that. The only thing we would have to introduce is standard number four, which is an Arbor Day observance and proclamation. Uh, so we have cities around us that do pretty cool things uh, to observe Arbor Day, uh, and that's up to us how we want to design that. Riverside, for example, I know uh, they have events where the community comes together uh, again, not authoritatively, but as a volunteer community and plants trees around the city. Um, they also offer discounts from local businesses if uh, residents want to buy trees. 
Uh, so there's, there, there's a few ways that we can approach that, uh, but that would be the only thing that we would have to add uh, as part of these four standards. The application for this opens up in September, so um, we are, we would essentially be voting to apply when the time comes in a few months. Uh, does it, it does it allow us to require a day off for an Arbor Day? <laughs> Again, since it's not a government authority, we can decide if we want a day off. Which why not? You ask me the answer. No. Yeah. Good. I, I've got a couple questions. Yes, um, uh, I mean, I'm all for trees. Uh, to not want lots of shade and good-looking trees would be like denying apple pie to an American. Yeah, I mean, obviously we want good-looking trees. I am not, uh, two questions, I'm not yet clear on who, I mean, I hear Parks Committee, Parks and Recreation Committee, uh, but I'm, I'm not yet clear because I, I can show you, I can drive you through town and show you some trees that I don't think they've been thinned out and, uh, for however long. So who, who's gonna tell them this tree's gonna blow over on your neighbor's fence if you don't get it thinned out pretty soon? Uh, that's not clear to me yet. So where is the, uh, is this going to be a request from the Parks and Recreation Committee? Um, are they going to do some kind of inventory? Or how's that, how's that going to work? Because there's some sycamore trees around here that are dense, and they're going to blow over one of these days. Is that, is that within the purview of what we're talking about here? So for the committee themselves, they can make recommendations to our body. Um, for enforcement, I would need some help to answer that question from the city manager itself. Uh, and then you had a third point. What was the third one? There's a third question in there. Well, I'm, that's the one I'm focused on now. And I, the, the other question is uh, to uh, the community must document at least $2 per capita toward planting, care, and removal of city trees. And you kind of passed over that and said we already do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know we did that, but that's why this is an easy. Thing. What's that? That's why this is an easy thing to do. The money's already there. We already spent what sixty. This this year alone, we spent sixty thousand dollars for tree trimming and twenty thousand for a tree planting program. Which is but but again three dollars. And, and $3. I'm not trying to get picky uni here, but. Those are trees on city-owned property. Those are not private trees. Correct. So how does that work? I'm, 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 I'm not planning to go to private properties to, to trim their trees or, or do a court enforcement on their trees. And that makes perfect sense to me. I just want to be sure we're clear on this because it, it could potentially be kind of an interesting dilemma. Yeah, and I think the concern that both of you have brought is, you know, are we going to go around and say you can have this tree, you can't have this tree, which the answer to that is no, we're not, um, especially on private property, right? We don't have that right. Um, the biggest focus that we can do, in my opinion, as a city council is look at areas that are under city purview um, and see how we can either better manage them or if we wanted to expand uh, tree cover in the city, how we would go about doing that. And the reason, the reason I was concerned about it is because of the, uh, not exactly recent, but slightly mm -hmm. recent uh, experience in Redlands. Redlands had a situation where a church cut down some trees yeah. on the public right-of-way, and you would think that World War III had begun. Yeah. So there are some people who take power a little bit too seriously so I just want to make sure we're not doing that because you know we're we're a friendly city we're not you know we're not here to harass people unless of course something is egregious but. does city staff have a recommendation or opinion on this let, let me ultimately it's gonna Dr. Lenard's got a couple of comments real quick 
I was just going to say this kind of reminds me of the Paris Climate Accords. Um, we were doing better than any country in there. So, and we pulled out, still doing better than any country in there. So I guess I would ask, why would we need to belong to an organization when we're already doing all the goals of the organization better than is required by the organization and opening the door for the organization to come and start giving us recommendations? So and I'm always worried about what does something cost? What is it eventually going to cost? What's the downside for it? And so forth. And I, I, I haven't heard what the real advantage to this, just so we can go out and say, I'm Tree City. It's performative. Huh? Performative. Performative. Yeah. What? It's, it's, uh, virtue signaling. Virtue signaling is the, is the synonym for that, yes. Yeah, I got yeah. I, it, that's got a negative connotation. I didn't want to say that, but that's, but, that's, it's, but it is right. what it is. Kind of paves the path. I, I think I would have two more answers on that. First of all, uh, they're not coming in here to tell us what to do, but they do offer grants, uh, which I think would be beneficial for the city if we wanted to go the route and um, you know, in, increase our tree cover. Second, I look at it as, a, as our blue zone designation. I mean, that's something that city residents are pretty proud of, of having. And I think this goes well in that conjunction, right? Because having trees ha means a healthier community. Um, so my answer to, you know, why would we want an extra designation is the same answer. Why do we want to be known as a blue zone? So I'll, I'll weigh in with just a couple of comments. I, I don't think it's anything uh, detrimental. I mean, it's, uh, we're, we're looking for a designation uh, from this organization. I don't think it changes how we do business or, or at least at this point, we don't have to change anything um, and then obviously as things come up we could always reevaluate if that runs afoul of our of our thought process but I'm I'm supportive of it because at this point I, I don't think there's anything negative that I see so do we need to take a vote on it all right let's take a vote do we have is a motion it, is it a straw poll or I'll take a motion to uh, whether or not we support this cool I'll move okay we have a motion and I'll make a second just just to actually get us to the vote so uh, I know often the chair doesn't do that but I will second that and Madam Clerk, let's call the roll. And the motion is to uh, make application to for designation as a Tree City USA. Councilman Jindal? Aye. Councilman Lenart? No. Councilman Rigsby? I'll say yes. Pardon? I said I'll say yes. I, I just want to comment that I, I really appreciate the input from Mr. Sonnentag. I think he's done a thoughtful job. And I think uh, we've answered his concerns. And um, you know, he may tell me he disagrees. But I, I don't think that this does anything to ramp up authoritarianism in our city. I think we're safe. So I'll vote yes. So that was a yes. OK, thank you. <laughs> Mayor for Tempore Daily. Aye. And Mayor Duper? Yes. And, and I dropped the ball before we called for the vote. We, we did get, um, you know, everybody should have them in front of you, several letters in support of the designation, and then we did get one letter in opposition. Uh, but I think we answered some of those questions uh, that were brought up in that opposition letter. So, okay, looks like we got it. Let's send in the application. Doesn't mean they'll grant it though, right? you go we'll try I would like to thank Councilman Jindal for putting in the footwork on that yes um, I think it's I think it's kind of a an easy thing to do we all love trees it doesn't ramp up any authoritarianism so it's a good thing thank you okay moving on to the next item number 16 it is to approve the schedule a pertaining to the contract with the sheriff's department so, uh, Dr. Daly, I will hand this over to you because out of an abundance of caution, 
because of my relationships, uh, employment relationships, I will abstain from participating in this. Okay. Um, is there a presentation that goes with this? No, no sir. It's, it's in the package. No, I, I have the, the, the uh, Schedule A. So the fee for next year will be six million three hundred nineteen thousand four hundred four dollars. And what? How does that compare with what we we paid for the current fiscal year? For for our current year, we pay six million fifty two thousand seven seventy two, which is a four point four percent increase from from this year to next year, that's all. Okay. Uh, does our representative from law enforcement have any comment they want to make? No, I don't. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Um, any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I want to, in the past, I just want to see if my recollection of the cost per FTE is correct. It's about $250,000 per per 40 hour work week FTE equivalent and that's and I understand that's fully loaded so that we don't pay for their vacation. We actually get backfill. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Other so questions? Is it about 250 still? How many FTEs do we get out of this contract? We have night I mean uh, 17 17 deputies. Okay, so it's considerably more than fifteen deputies and two uh, traffic deputies. Okay, so it's more like three hundred and forty-seven thousand dollars per FTE. It's really gone up. But but this this total include point five six a lieutenant, two point five two of the sergeant. So is is include oh, okay. detective half point five six a detective. So when you add all of the support staff, it. Correct. Comes down, but since we don't know how many of those, I can't calculate. But okay. And I'm free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I also understand that the um, the actual deputies get a small percentage of that money. Because <laughs> a lot of it is the the it, car it, yes. insurance, the insurance, yes, insurance. The, and the insurance is no small price tag. And that's yeah. to that, me that, that, that skyrockets each that year. That insurance is the main reason. I don't support an independent police department for our city because the last thing I want is to have some kind of an incident and have us sitting here deciding are we going to settle for 27 million or 53 million and you know put us in hock for the next 20 years I'd rather have the county make those decisions other questions of council members Uh, if not, I, I'm assuming that when we see level of service, and I read 0.59 lieutenant, we're paying, um, that's basically prorating, uh, it's an estimated prorating of how much effort a lieutenant would put into providing supervision of Loma Linda um, sheriffs, deputies. Yes. Okay. And so when I see 2.52 sergeant, um, that implies there's two sergeants plus that are active in Loma Linda all the time, full-time basis. Not, not all the time. We, we basically have one, one sergeant at any one given time. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? If there are none, then uh, we're open for a motion to approve Schedule A for law enforcement services. I move approval. Okay. Second. We have a first, a second, and a third. Madam Clerk. Okay, the motion is to approve Schedule A pertaining to the contract with the Sheriff's Department. Councilman Jendal. Councilman Lennart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly? <laughs> Aye. And Mayor Duper abstains. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Uh, moving on to reports of council members. And I've got a couple of things. If We do have an addendum 
to the consent calendar? It should have been at the very top of your packet. Yes. That we already moved. Not I thought agenda. that was part of the. Uh, that was part of my motion. Do we vote? Yeah, do we do we have to do an emergency addition? Uh, or was this was this published with adequate notice? Yes, I, I believe the agenda went out. The same day. At the same time. Yes. No. So was numbered with the other agenda items. It would require a separate motion. It or it doesn't. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Uh, anything from council members? I've got one thing from uh, Mr. Dick Wiley wanted us to be aware of something. He uh, got a couple of phone calls this week from the Redland Social Security Office uh, telling him there was a problem with his account. Um, obviously, he didn't give him any information, but he contacted Social Security where they informed him that this is a well-known scam. And so uh, Dick would like everybody to know, our residents to know, that the Social Security Office will not call you and ask you for those types of things. And if you do get a phone call, to call them directly, correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Dick, for bringing that to our attention. Uh, I, know, I know we just discussed it. Maybe this will be an agenda item uh, for a future council meeting. But I know last year when we did budget prep, our uh, budget committee uh, suggested uh, this as a priority last year, and then they have also suggested it this year, and that is that we do a feasibility study uh, to look at law enforcement uh, options because the price tag keeps going up. Um, and so I think at some point we need to do that because that's been a request from um, internally now for two years. And so uh, we may have to make that an agenda item for next, next council meeting where we hire a, a company to come and do a feasibility study for us because I I listened to the comments and questions you guys had, and we can probably figure out how to answer those. Any ballpark figure on how much those studies cost? Since retired officers are usually the people who do it, you guys probably know how much. Actually, um, I, I think there's a, a company called CityGate, uh, which does a lot of other similar studies, and I know they recently did one for the city of Ranch Cucamonga. Uh, so these are not. Uh, not retirees or people like that. They're they're well known in the business across the country. So I think but I'm just, I think I'm we just have wondering to do does it cost does it cost more than the savings they propose for the study? I, I don't know. I'm sure we're talking probably <laughs> 10, 15, 20 grand for a study at some point. Is that all? Um, I mean I, I don't know. So I, I would say staff will have to bring that back up. Yeah. But I, I think it's our it's our point of due diligence to make sure that we are getting the yeah. the best deal. And if we're not, then we find a different provider. So that's all I got. Anybody else? Okay, that looks like that closes the uh, city council agenda and we will move on to the Loma Linda Housing Authority. Mr. City Manager, do we have any items to be added or deleted? No, sir. Any reports or comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll move into the consent calendar. Uh, first, and a second, Madam Clerk. The motion is to approve the items on the Housing Authority consent calendar. Councilman Jindal? Aye. Councilman Lennart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any new business, member reports, reports of officers? No? I would just like to make one comment. Yes, sir. One of the positive comments about the Tree City said, oh, and we need more affordable housing. I wish everybody knew what, how loaded those words were because I think with the, when the general public talks about affordable housing, they say they want cheaper houses to choose from. They don't mean affordable housing, which in California means subsidized housing that's massively expensive. Yes. Uh, in a just a follow-up comment to that, I believe there is uh, legislation that's pending right now that would take away a city's right uh, for specific zoning and would uh, force us to allow somebody, to, so for example, next to your castle, mm -hmm. or uh, home, uh, uh, Dr. Rigsby, you, that somebody the wanted ex, to put in an apartment complex, the they, would, mansion. They, would, they would be allowed to put in that said apartment complex. 
because uh, the state of California believes that housing is so short right now that people should be allowed to put in those types of things anywhere that they want. Mm -hmm. Is that correct for my legislative folks? Yes, that is correct. So that, that legislation is pending. It probably will pass. So um, like you said, when folks talk about affordable housing, it, it's all great until it's next door. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the successor agency agenda. Mr. City Manager, any items to be added or deleted? No, sir. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Out in the, nope, not in the Zoom world either. And uh, we have the consent calendar. I have second. a motion and a second. Madam Clerk. And the motion is to approve the items on the successor agency consent calendar. Councilman Chindall. Aye. Councilman Lennart. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tempore Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. It passes. Thank you. That concludes this meeting, and uh, we're done for the night. Thank you.